What's up, everyone? Welcome to this day, Philly Sports History for July 18th, 2024. I'm your host, Jim Montgomery. Welcome to a Thursday edition of the podcast. A couple more days left here in no man's land for the Philly sports calendar. Literally nothing is going on, but there are a lot of Phillies rumors out there as far as what they might or may not do at the trade deadline. And there's a lot of talk about, oh, we can't get rid of Aiden Miller. We can't get rid of Andrew Painter. We can't. They're, the prospects are too good. You're mortgaging the future, which a couple thoughts on that. I think the first thing is if you've ever bought a house or a car or took out a loan or whatever, you're mortgaging your future, but you're getting something that you can use during that time. Like my mortgage will be paid off in 20 years or, or whatever. Um, my, I just paid off my truck payment and I had six years worth. Kind of hamstrung what I could do for those six years, but I needed that truck to go around. So if the cost of trading for someone who is going to help you be able to win this year, which what you have going on right now, this is the window wide open, and then possibly set you up for success for the next couple of years, I think you got to go for it no matter what the cost. And once you get used to not having those prospects in your farm system, you adjust just like I got used to paying that payment. You make changes and you were still able to survive and live. So I'd be cautious to say they are untouchable and we can't go after them. And all you got to do is go back to Don Brown, who for years, Ruben Amaro hung on to Don Brown. And how did that work out? And you could have traded Don Brown a few different times to replenish your farm system, but they held on to him because he was a six-tool player who literally had a good six-week stretch and made an all-star team, and that was the extent of Don Brown's career. So I, I'm not saying just trade for whoever. Be smart about it, obviously. Do the research, and you, you don't want to trade somebody like that for a, a half-a-year rental or like a 60-some game rental. But if you can get somebody that's going to be here for a few years – and it's going to cost you one of those guys, and that guy is going to win you at least one World Series or, or get you to the point where you can, I don't know if I'd be holding on to them. Um, I think too many times we overvalue our prospects and our young players and people who we think are going to be the next big thing. And truthfully, sometimes they're just not as good as what we we think and claim they are so that's just sort of my take on that you may agree you might disagree but let me know are aiden miller and andrew Payne are untouchable 267-495-8531 that's the back to the future voice and text line text me shoot me a voicemail whatever you got to do but i think if you can get somebody that you have under your control for a couple years for one of these guys that's going to help you win now I think you got to go for it. And, and like I said, you can only you only have to go back, what, 13 years to Don Brown and how they did not want to get rid of him. And he had six weeks. That was literally his career was six weeks. He turned it into an all-star game to his credit, but I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on that. And then what do you think they need? I, I'd rather see a, a bullpen guy. Yeah, they could use a, a, a guy off the bench that could provide some average and maybe even some pop, but I I don't think you can have too much bullpen help. But those are my thoughts on what's happening Sixers trade room or Phillies trade rumor wise. I if you can make your team better by getting rid of one of those prospects, I think you got to do it. We are not in the prospect game right now. We are in the World Series championship game. So let's that's what our primary focus should be. And again, I'm not saying just get rid of them willy nilly for whoever, but if you're smart and it makes sense, I would have zero problem because obviously you have the guys in place that have been picking these guys that makes these prospects so highly touted. So who's to say that they can't find the next Aiden Miller, the next Andrew Painter. And so many times these prospects get traded And they don't turn into anything. But that's my thought. But let me know what you think. 267-495-8531. That's the Back to the Future voice and text line. And it'll get you in. 
Be sure to check out my boys over at the Clashing Conferences podcast. A new episode drops tomorrow. They had the football, they had the basketball, and now they're dipping their toes into baseball and they're doing good things, Steven and the crew. So go check them out wherever you get your podcasts as well as on YouTube. And while you're at it, go to Philly Goat. Check out the John Cruck is My Spirit Animal shirt. 10% of those proceeds will go to benefit the Battle Brothers Foundation. That organization, if you look them up, they do great things for our veterans. Very good organization. So go to Philly Goat. Use the promo code Jim Montgomery for 10% off your order. Check out everything they have, too. Pick up the Crux shirt, some shoes, and, and be sure, since there's nothing, nothing going on in Philly sports, scroll through the site, look and see what they have. But be sure to use that promo code Jim Montgomery so we get credit and Ryan knows that you are a listener. PhillyGoat.com, promo code Jim Montgomery for 10% off of your order. Gary Trent Jr. is not coming to the Sixers. He signed with the Bucks. It happens, and there has to be a reason for it, and it's hard to be disappointed with what Daryl Morey and the front office has done. There's still a couple minor moves left to be made, but I am excited heading into this off or this season, I I should say. Training camp, I think they get way in October, so we've got a couple months to to kind of relax and, and gear up for that. Don't get too excited here but the union finally won a game they did so convincingly five to one over new england uh, ty Bar- barbo had a hat trick uh they're out of last place finally slowly moving up maybe they can go on a run looks like the offense woke up Kevin sullivan made his debut last night the youngest player to ever play in the mls 14 years and whatever months uh, breaking Freddie Adu's record from like 20 years ago, I think it is. Uh, but the future maybe is bright now for the Union. Maybe they can build this momentum. It's the first time they won in 10 games. First time they won down in Subaru Park in like 110 days or something crazy like that. But Barabo with the hat trick. Kevin Sullivan with his debut. Let's keep it rolling. All right, today we're going to go back to 1954. And. On this day in 1954, it was one of the more interesting days in Philly's history. Phils and the Cardinals played what can only be described as a wild doubleheader down in St. Louis. Phillies won game one 11 to 10 in 10 innings. It was 112 degrees uh, on the field for the start of that game. And it also included an hour and 18 minute rain delay. So you can just imagine the humidity and just how soupy and sloppy and miserable it was on the field. Remember, they wore thicker uniforms back then too. But in that game, Grant, Granny Hamner went three for five with a homer, two doubles, two RBIs, scored three runs. Hamner is in the Phillies Wall of Fame as well as the Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame. Game two got underway, and it got a little more crazy. Phils were winning 7-1 to one in this game in the top of the fifth. Cardinals were getting frustrated, threw at one of the Phillies player, and all this, all I can say is this led to a massive brawl, led to multiple ejections. The coaches were fighting each other. The managers were fighting. And then, because the first game was so long, had that rain delay, Phils were dominating in game two, the brawl took a while to sort out and figure out who was ejected, who was not. Obviously, it started to get a little dark. So the Cardinals realized this, and there's two things here into play. Obviously, for Major League Baseball, you have to go five innings. And since it was in St. Louis, you had to complete the fifth inning since the Cardinals were losing in order for it to be an official game. There was also a local ordinance in St. Louis that said once you started a game, you cannot turn, which makes no sense, but you cannot turn on the lights to complete the game. So the Cardinals knew this. So they began to stall and kind of drag their feet to make the umpire call the game for darkness so they would be able to replay the game or I don't know whether it would have started over or picked up where it was. But either way, they knew what they were doing. So they were stalling. Um the, the manager went out to uh, the mound a few times to talk to his players. Uh, one of the players threw the ball purposefully five feet in front of him, allowing another run to score, and just all kinds of shenanigans to drag this game out 
to ensure that it would not become official. Uh, then they made some pitching changes, three in one inning, and the guys would take their time, slow walking to the mound. And finally, the umpire had enough. He forfeited the game, said, that's it. You guys are not playing in the spirit of the game. Called it, forfeited the game in favor of the Phillies. So the Phillies swept both both games, and but game two officially in the books goes down as a 0-0 forfeit for the Phillies. But a wild day in St. Louis in 1954 on this day. Phillies won game one, 11-10, a game that featured a one-hour and 18-minute rain delay. That went 10 innings. And in game two, there was brawls, a lot of slow play shenanigans, I guess you could call it. Managers were fighting, and the umpire, probably because of the heat, uh, everybody was a little on edge, but umpire finally forfeited the game in favor of the Phillies, giving them the 0-0 forfeit win. So the Phillies did win both games of the doubleheader on this day in St. Louis in 1954. All right, it is time for the ultimate Philly sports nickname tournament. The Sweet 16 is here. We'll get more into that in a minute, but let's recap yesterday's action out of the Balboa region, it was the number two seed, the Flying Hawaiian, moving on with 59% of the vote, knocking off Gang Green. Gang Green was winning for most of the day, but a lot of votes for the Flying Hawaiian came in overnight. So Shane Victorino is moving on to the Sweet 16. And then out of the Schuylkill region, kind of close, uh, a little more close than what I thought it was going to be, but Chooch pulls off the win over Puddin' Head, 67% of the vote. So the number three seed, Chooch, is moving on out of the Schuylkill region. All right, so let's take a look at the, the teams here. Today we're going to do the cheesesteak and the Ben Franklin region. So let's look at the brackets there. And out of the cheesesteak region, the top four seeds moved on. Chocolate Thunder, Legion of Doom, The Answer, and The Round Mound of Rebound all moved on to the Sweet 16. So very chalky. And then out of the Ben Franklin, kind of similar. The Broad Street Bullies, the one seed moved on. Boston Strangler, the two seed moved on. Uh, World Be Free, the four seed moved on. And Smokin' Joe, the six seed, made it all the way to the Sweet 16. Um, has a tough matchup against the Boston Strangler. World Be Free is taking on Broad Street Bullies. We'll get more into that in a minute. And then uh, over in the Cheesesteak region, Chocolate Thunder is taking on the Round Mound of Rebound. And then today, it's the Legion of Doom versus the Answer. Let's get right into that matchup. Uh, it's an all Sixers versus Flyers day today. Not purposely, just the luck of the bracket. So let's start with that Cheesesteak region matchup. The number two seed, the Legion of Doom. John LeClaire, Eric Lindros, Michael, Mikhail Remberg all played on the same line named the Legion of Dune line. Named that way by uh, a reserve player and ended up, I think he's a coach now somewhere, but Jim Montgomery and then made more popular by Gene Hart, uh, who was the Flyers announcer. Uh, but these dudes were, were studs. So from 95 to 97... They just uh, dominated. And, I mean, they were intimidating both offensively and defensively. But all of them were 6'2", 230 or more. Uh, regular season and playoff combined, they scored 306 goals and 491 assists. So they were just out there lighting the lamp. They won two Atlantic Division titles, went to two Eastern Conference Finals, and one Stanley Cup Final before Scotty Bowman figured out a way to neutralize the Flyers in the uh, 97 Stanley Cup while coaching for Detroit. Uh, but one of the more popular and one of the better lines to ever play for the Flyers, the number two seed is the Legion of Doom. And as I've done every time they've played, I'd be remiss if I did not mention, very similar to the Road Wars of the old school WCW and WWF. They are taking on the answer. Allen Iverson, number one pick in 96 out of Georgetown. His One of his family friends said he is the answer to Georgetown's problems. And as I said, every time so far, he certainly was the answer to the Sixers' problems. But more than that, he sort of changed the look in the face of the NBA between his cornrows, tattoos, the way he dressed. Uh, even the way he dressed on the court, uh, longer baggy shorts. He was one of the first ones to wear one of the arm sleeves. Um, 
really, like I said, changed the culture of the NBA. Uh, in Philly, though, he was a seven-time All-Star, two-time All-Star game MVP, three-time NBA first team, three-time NBA second team, rookie of the year, led the league in steals three times. He's on the all-75th anniversary NBA team, won that MVP in 2001 with 31.1 points per game, two and a half steals, 4.6 assists, and 3.8 rebounds. And it honestly was one of the more magical best runs in Philly sports history. Uh, I think I'm getting some ideas for next year's tournament based on that. Uh, but just the, the entire city, the entire region, not even the entire city, the entire region just came together for that Sixers run. Uh, and AI was such a huge part of that. But it is all about the best Philly sports nickname. So who do you got in this matchup in the Sweet 16? The number two seed, the Legion of Doom, or the number three seed, the Answer? Ah, I think I got a lean Legion of Doom if it was up to me. But get your vote in, 267-495-8531. That's the Back to the Future voice and text line. Leave a voicemail, text me, whatever you got to do. You can also hit me up on social media, Jimbo underscore Mont on Twitter and TikTok, at Philly Jimbo on Instagram. I am working on trying to switch my uh, TikTok and Twitter, but stay tuned for that. Uh, you can always hit me up on Facebook, email, comment, wherever you're watching this. Send me a text message, smoke signal, whatever you got to do. But who wins the cheesesteak region? Who's got the better Philly sports nickname? Is it the number two seed, the Legion of Doom? The number three seed, the answer? You let me know. And now we're moving over to the Ben Franklin region. The number one seed, the Broad Street Bullies. Get, the name started in 1972-73 during that season, and the Flyers' identity changed. They were kind of like a middling team, like had some talented players but didn't have an identity, and then they just started to become more aggressive and change their way and mindset and the way they were playing. And the name really is fitting for the way those Flyers teams played. And truthfully, even when Bobby Clark became the general manager, he sort of kept some of those same Broad Street bully principles, even though the league itself was changing, sometimes to the detriment of the way the franchise uh, could move on into the playoffs. But they did win two Stanley Cups. They made it to, I guess we'll count the 79-80. So they made it to four Stanley Cups, winning two of them. But they are one of the most beloved teams in Philly, specifically with Flyers fans. Flyers fans, I mean, they're smart, and they know that it was time to change the style of play. But Flyers fans, you guys love that those Stanley Cup teams. And I always say, and this is not a knock against Flyers fans or, or any fans in Philly, but you have... Sixers, Eagles, Phillies fans who also are Flyers fans. And then you have Flyers fans who are also Phillies, Sixers, Eagles fans. It's just the dynamic of, I don't know if it's a hockey thing or what, but Fred Shiro was their coach. He was in this tournament. His nickname was The Fog. But one of the best, better quotes ever of uh, before that game six of the 74 Stanley Cup, win to get, win to, win to, today walk together forever uh the flyers names still are on the cup they'll be there until 2031 jack chevalier Lair, uh from the philadelphia bulletin is responsible for giving them the or is credited with giving them the nickname even though it was the headline writer who put them in the order of broad street bullies but the team like i said embodied this nickname and they are the number one seed out of the ben franklin region Taking on the number four seed, World B. Free, Lloyd Bernard Free was born in Brownsville, New York, and that's where his name came from. His uh, teammates and guys he played against said, you're not all county, you're not all city, you're not all state, you're all world. Uh, he was known for his high-risk, high-reward play. Very flamboyant style would fit very well in today's NBA. Uh, he's known for having a high-arcing shot. Uh, and he did that, and it goes back to his days on the playground. He said he was tired of getting blocked, so he figured if he put enough arch on it, guys could not jump high enough to block his shot, which is smart. He did play in the NBA much better when he was not in Philly. Spent four years with the Sixers, one of them at the end of his career. Uh, but probably the best thing he did to help the team out was he was the guy that was traded to the Clippers in 1978 for the draft pick that would ultimately become 
Charles Barkley in 1984. I officially changed his name to World Be Free in 1981. And as I mentioned, that's why he's in this tournament. Because when he played for the Sixers the first go around, his nickname or his name was Lloyd. His nickname was World. Still is involved with the Sixers today. Fan favorite, but again, would would end up fitting very well in today's NBA. All right, so now it's your turn. Who's got the better Philly sports nickname? Is it the Broad Street Bullies or World Be Free out of the Ben Franklin region? The number two seed Legion of Doom or the answer out of the cheesesteak? 267-495-8531 will get you into the Back to the Future voice and text line. Comment wherever you are. Hit me up on social media, but get your vote in. On this day back in 1954, Philly swept the Cardinals in a doubleheader 11-10 and won the second game via forfeit due to the Cardinals pulling stall tactics and a big brawl that broke out, uh, likely due to the 112-degree temperature. I know I get angry when it gets hot and sweaty and everything like that. And it rained on top of it, so it's probably humid. But that all happened on this day in 1954. Union with a win. The dog days are almost over. I'm telling you, starting Friday, things are going to fly by. Got the Olympics coming up on the horizon. Trying to figure out some ways to incorporate the Olympics into the podcast. It's supposed to finally be cooler today, which is good. So go out and enjoy it. This has been This Day in Philly Sports History for July 18th, 2024. I'm Jim Montgomery. Go have yourselves a Thursday. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you.